Okay, folks, uh, welcome aboard again for those that just joined. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Really appreciate your time on this Wednesday afternoon here, East Coast time. Now, um, I do also realize that there was a change in time due to some schedule issues that came up for me. So I'm sorry for any disruptions. I do appreciate your time and um, I'll be as efficient as possible. I'm going to be covering some interesting aspects of cloud security, mainly around how to mitigate those risks. Now, if there's any questions, uh, again, feel free to chat it in. I'll be monitoring the chat and uh, you know, really cover as much material as I can in about uh, 15 minutes or so. I'm gonna leave about 10 minutes for Q&A. And there will be a recording of this, and this will be distributed by WebAge. So you go back and listen in and hopefully look at resources. And uh, you know, also feel free to reach out for, to uh, WebAge or account rep uh, and talk about you know, security and, and what else you could do as an organization. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, as far as uh, risk mitigation, now let's just talk about what a risk is, right? Um, a risk is basically what? Something that could happen depending on the circumstances. Now, some of these risks could be mitigated, some may not be mitigated. And this is again a, a challenge, right? Every organization is dynamic, uh, every organization is fluid, some organizations may be more static than others. Um, also, too, here's some notes about uh, just uh, basically questions that come up. Again, slides will be available uh, as well. And uh, if you have questions, just feel free to speak up. Uh, recording's also available. So let's go ahead and do a quick intro before we get into the content. Now, my name's Joseph Holbrook. I've been a cloud architect for several years, I mean, five plus years at least. And um, before that, I did a lot of data storage. I did a ton of pre-sales and services work, working for organizations such as EMC, VMware, Dimension Data, Brocade Communications, um, 3PAR, HP, uh, HPE. And um, one of the things that I've had the unique experience with is to be able to go into organizations and, and you know, see what they're doing in all types of industries, from phar pharmaceuticals to, uh, to uh, basically financial, to hedge funds, over to manufacturing, uh, even, either, you know, even other vendors uh, as well. Now, I'm also a published uh, LinkedIn uh, learning course author, as well as a Pearson course author as well. I also have uh, a book coming out on blockchain uh, technology uh, with cloud computing, um, sort of an interesting mix that's coming out uh, for those uh, interested in cloud architectures and blockchain combined. It'll be out uh, this, uh, this uh, spring on Wiley with Wiley Publishing. Now, um, I'm based out of Jacksonville, Florida, uh, again, and um, for those folks that just joined, um, I'm up here in Madison, Wisconsin, talking cloud uh, with a, a client, uh, enjoying uh, the good weather up here. Uh, with that said, let's get started. We're gonna go ahead 
and talk about Cloud Security 101. For those folks that are sort of new to the cloud, you know, what are what is typically cloud security mean and what exactly um, can an organization basically look look at um, to understand what their security posture is. This is just going to be a real short, you know, couple paragraphs we're going to talk about briefly. I want to talk about the current threat landscape. Now we're going to touch on the major threats that are out there to an enterprise. So whether you're um, whether you're in a pharmaceutical industry or you're an educational institution, government agency, financial company, uh, there's going to be threats that are going to definitely be a challenge to uh, to your organization to mitigate. Uh, now, we'll also, once we talk about the current threats, we'll go ahead and talk about some of the, the techniques. Now, I'm going to cover the top 10 techniques. Now, once again, there's a lot more than just 10 of them. I just want to cover really the areas to focus on um, this coming uh, winter and early next year. Because one of the challenges in organizations that I've ran into is you just can't go in there and make a change right away. You've got change control to deal with. You've got planning to deal with. You may have to go out and procure specific uh, items like firewalls, or you may have to procure um, you know, cloud services, whatever that is. So I understand it takes time. And that's why we want to give you some head start here to start thinking about where you could go. Then, uh, like I said, I'm going to leave about a 10 minutes for Q&A. Uh, if you need more time, I'm happy to make myself available as well. So what is, uh, what is uh, cloud security? Now, cloud security is essentially a shared responsibility model. When we talk about the cloud, remember that whether you're using Amazon or you're using Salesforce or you're using uh, IBM Cloud or whatever cloud, Rackspace, et cetera, this is a shared responsibility. Now, a lot of the responsibility will vary, of course, based on um, are you using software as a service or are you using infrastructure as a service? A lot of it is a service model or the deployment model, right? Now, cloud computing security is generally viewed as a complex area. It really isn't complex if you are already doing, uh, you know, basically IT security now, then this is all transferable. And remember the cloud, what is it? It's basically web traffic. Now, you have your common web traffic issues, of course, but it's also more than that now. The cloud is not just web traffic. It could be everything from APIs, uh, you know, APIs for those folks that are not familiar with APIs. What's an API? It's basically a remote procedure call at its finest level. And for those folks familiar with Unix, you know what an RPC request is, right? A service call. An API is basically going to act as an interface between your client and the cloud provider. Then we have endpoints. We're going to talk about endpoints as well because that's an area of weakness uh, in the sense that. Uh, Typically, endpoints are managed by developers, and developers are exceptionally intelligent and uh, well-versed in the cloud. However, they have a tendency to forget some of the, the basic operational security procedures, so it's very important we focus. Okay, now, um, let me just adjust my camera just a little bit there. Okay, now, when it comes to performing functionality uh, in cloud computing, it's basically very similar to what you're doing in um, traditional IT. Now, for example, if you're using Google Cloud Platform, you have services that are freely available to you, such as uh, an app engine or compute engine. You have what's called Security Scanner. This is a great way to get development trained up to go ahead and look at those applications that are gonna roll out and actually try to get some visibility into CSS issues, cross-site scripting that is, right? Look at coding issues, any kind of other vulnerabilities that are pretty common, right? 
it's a good tool to get started. If you use an Amazon Web Services, you have Trusted Advisor, right? That's another tool that has uh, different levels, but to, to actually, you could use a free version or you could use the um, cost version, it's up to you. Now, also too, um, protecting your critical information from theft, data leakage, and deletion. Now, one of the challenges uh, when I go into organizations is that a lot of organizations typically always have the, they have the idea that the threats are actually coming from outside the organization. Now that's true. However, the threats can certainly come from inside the organization. And I'll talk about some of those threats as well. And uh, let's see, how are we doing questions? Any questions? Uh, okay, nothing yet, okay. Now, let's go ahead and talk about, for example, the shared responsibility model. Now, AWS, just like any cloud provider, they pretty much tell you what kind of threats um, that they're going to uh, be able to uh, help you with. They, but not so much that, they give you advice. They're not gonna do this for you. They give you a lot of best practices. They have a very good security white paper. But basically, if you read the security documentation, they talk about the shared responsibility model. Basically, what you as a consumer need to look at, but also to what the provider does. Who handles the key management, for example? Who handles the firewall rules? Who's going to handle the patching, right? All of these things are very clearly defined. And out of fact, AWS has some really good graphics on this and they make it so simple to be able to figure out what do I need to do. Now, AWS owns the infrastructure, right? And again, because they own the infrastructure, part of that shared security model is to, of course, validate and vet, you know, basically anyone physically present at the data center. So you as an organization, if you're managing a data center now, you don't have to worry about physical security in the cloud. That's probably one of the, the big changes that you, you're going to have to get used to. The other thing is, is you know, again, you're not gonna manage the hardware. This is all done by the provider. And th there's of course more involved, but you know, we wanna focus on the main threats and, and how to mitigate them. But just some things to think about. So the enterprise, you as an organization, what you need to focus on is when I deploy that AMI, and now an AMI uh, is an Amazon machine image. That Amazon machine image could be in, you know, whatever um, Linux version that you want. Uh, but basically an AMI, for example, if you're gonna deploy the Amazon version of Linux, you could do that. You could deploy SUSE, you could deploy Red Hat, et cetera. That's up to you. But when you deploy that template to that VM, you then need to go ahead and um, basically be able to um, uh, understand uh, how to assess that template for any vulnerabilities uh, you know, that, that you're gonna deploy uh, on that VM. I actually, you're gonna have to assess that template, right? Before you deploy any applications on it. Again, there may be additional patching that needs to be done. You may wanna add applications and services on top of that VM. Um, but, but again, um, what is this? Hold on. sorry, let me turn that phone off. Uh, but again, just be aware that uh, there's going to uh, be um, some responsibility. When it comes to cloud providers, uh, it's important to understand that the cloud provider is um, going to uh, need to um, help facilitate, for example, a lot of the um, threat identification. One of the things that they're going to, to help you with is provide some tools. Now, those tools, like I had mentioned, could be Security Scanner, if you use an App Engine, for example. It could also be Trusted Advisor with AWS, and there's certainly other tools out there as well that are available. Once again, you also have AWS Inspector, um, and also too, App Engine has, uh, always, has always had uh, pretty much uh, basically security scanner available for quite a while. 
but it is pretty new to Compute Engine. So that, that's a new change that in case you're not aware of. Now, as with technology, there's always vulnerabilities, right? Whether it's brand new, doesn't matter if it comes from IBM EMC or it comes from AWS or, or Google Cloud, there's going to be some kind of vulnerabilities. Now, whatever those vulnerabilities are, you know, one of your responsibilities as a consumer is to research those vulnerabilities. Once again, the cloud providers definitely go out of the way to, to mitigate these issues, but things can happen over time. Uh, but also too, you may be doing some testing. You may have developers that are trying new options, different syntaxes, whatever that is. For example, SQL. SQL, um, whether it's uh, MySQL, uh, you know, you're using MySQL, for example, uh, or Oracle SQL, or MS SQL, whatever version of SQL you're using, um, there's gonna be vulnerabilities in SQL, right? There's a lot of attacks that are typically, you know, common with SQL that could happen if you don't pay attention, right? So just be aware, you know, you could have injection attacks. A lot of these are very preventable now, and the vendors are pretty much on top of these issues. Now, if you're gonna use a managed service, such as Cloud SQL and Google, for example, a lot of this is already done for you, but again, there may be some issues on your side where you gotta pay attention to uh, what is supported and what isn't. Uh, not all the SQL uh, commands and syntaxes are supported, for example. Uh, quick note, um, just down the bottom here, threats can come from both internal and external sources. When it comes to cloud security threats, uh, a couple things that uh, you know may come up uh, would be around uh, compromise a platform. So what is a platform? Well, a platform could be AWS, it could be Google Cloud, it could be VMware vCloud, even if you have a private cloud, right? A lot of platforms do have specific um, possible threats that, that could occur or could be you know, uh, penetrated uh, initiated, whatever the term you want to use, right? Credentials, this is probably one of the bigger deals. Um, it's very common, for example, in organizations to, um, to basically have new people brought on board. But what happens when that person is terminated? Does that person's account get terminated along with it? For example, it's very easy to have a user provision resources and have it forgotten about in the cloud. I see this over and over. And my whole thought on it is you need to work with HR to have a proper, uh, a proper procedure in place, some policies to identify what happens when a user is terminated, whose responsibility is it to notify IT, and who in IT is actually gonna take responsibility for um, removing those resources. Now, as part of resources that, you know, we have what's called certificates. Maybe the user has some localized certificates, like maybe they downloaded PEM files. You wanna make sure that those certificates are no good anymore. Okay, denial of service attacks, right? Remember, we said that cloud is web. Okay, and we have a lot of issues around web related to the cloud. And one of the, one of the common issues is denial of service attacks. This is going to occur, continue to occur. It's fairly simple for a hacker, uh, you know, whether they're at a college university or whether they're sitting in their basement at home or at a company overseas, uh, wherever they're at, to initiate a bot uh, attack. Uh, where you basically spin up, you know, software that's freely available on Usenets, for example, and you could, you know, literally initiate a DDoS attack. Now, again, uh, you don't want to, um, you know, mitigate uh, the issue to the extent that you deny traffic that should be going to your website. So I'll talk more about that uh, coming up as well. Lack of compliance implementations. Now, for example, if you're using specific uh, 
uh, compliance uh, best practices. For example, if your company um, is a medical-based organization, healthcare-based, they probably have uh, the Healthcare uh, Act called HIPAA, uh, basically, that they have to abide by when it comes to information management. If you take credit cards, for example, you may need to deal with PCI, you know, basically the payment card industry. If you're a publicly traded company, you may need to, uh, you know, look at uh, using, for example, um, Sarbanes-Oxley uh, or, or SOX as it's known. A lot of things to look at. Lastly, inadequate training. When it comes to the number of threats that occur, training is definitely uh, one of the reasons that these threats uh, are able to come to fruition, but also because they're not mitigated as well. So let's think about this. Uh, through 2020, 95% of cloud security failures will be the customer's fault. This is according to Gartner. And they put out a report, basically top predictions for IT organizations and users for 2016 and beyond. And if you dig into a lot of the, the security hacks, for example, the Accenture issue with S3 or the Equifax hack or the Target hack, a lot of these could have been remedied with just basic training or basic awareness provided to the user base. So let's talk about how we mitigate issues in the cloud. Now, one of my favorite sayings is basically around uh, what Mr. Gandhi had stated, the future depends on, you know, basically what you do today. So one of the challenges as an IT um, administrator in the past that I've had is how do you get the time to actually be proactive, right? A lot of your jobs are very reactive. There's no preactive, you know, there's no really preempting done, right? There's no proactive behaviors uh, in a lot of organizations. A lot of that is just due to due to the culture. A lot of that is just due to the lack of lack of staff, lack of training, right? So we all have challenges. But again, do we want to make excuses for those challenges? That, that's a decision that we have to make. Let's go ahead and get started. So when we talk about these issues that come up, let's go ahead and talk about um, you know, some of the areas that, uh, that we want to think about and get started on. For example, did you know that when it comes to cloud data breaches, they're usually a result of improper training. This is actually documented um, by Accenture, for example. And one of the things that they had you know, stated was that they left four Amazon S3 buckets open to the public. They exposed over 137 gigs of customer data and customer credentials. This also contained classified information because on this share they had some uh, classified information for the US government. Now again, that's an extreme case of just plain ignorance and uh, just irresponsibility basically. Most, uh, you know, most uh, events that happen typically are not a result of just plain, you know, evident bad behavior, okay? A lot of it is I didn't patch this because I didn't know I had to patch it. A lot of it is, well, I wasn't aware that APIs can have different revisions. I didn't know that what a cloud endpoint was, so I didn't think to look at this, right? This is just going to be your typical de facto uh, excuses in a lot of cases. So let's go ahead and talk about um, the Accenture hack, for example. Now, it wasn't even a hack. Basically, just to clarify, right? Um, to get to Amazon S3, it's basically a URL. And anyone that has been on Amazon S3, you know what this syntax is, right? And you could simply go out there and guess basically what that syntax is. And so apparently um, some hackers that were you know, just scanning the namespace <laughs> figured this out pretty easy. So you'll be surprised how many customers may create file shares and just forget about them. It happens all the time. 
or in the case of uh, Amazon S3, they created buckets and folders and just dumped information in there and just left it wide open. Now, why would you want to leave a bucket open? There's really no good reason, right? Because again, you know, even if, unless if you're going to distribute content um, and have it in a manner that you're not going to have it, you know, exposed to other information, maybe you want to open it to the public, but generally you almost never want it public. You want to have credentials involved pretty much in most commercial use cases, right? Um, so basically here, I, this is just a, a graphic showing you of basically what had to be acknowledged in the first place. Basically, you get warnings in Amazon S3 saying, you know, wait, wait a minute here. This is, this is not a good idea. Think about this. And are you sure? So there's plenty of warning. It's not like this could be done by accident. It took more than a couple clicks to get this to be open to the public. Did you know that uh, in that it's estimated in 2017, 99 billion records uh, were exposed because data breaches? Now, with cloud computing, there's a, a lot of special services that you need to also understand, and these are called data services, right? These are services such as Amazon Kinesis, right? Or uh, Google BigQuery, right? Or Google Cloud BigQuery. You know, it's Microsoft Azure Blockchain Services or Workbench, right? There's all these services you have to understand now. It could also be just simply, you know, SQL. It could be a uh, new SQL. Could be any of these services available in the cloud, right? There's also machine learning. Let's, uh, I'll talk about an issue with machine learning and automated intelligence that can come up as well here in a minute. Now, when it comes to automated intelligence, this is actually a good way to help thwart attacks, but it's also a great way to have hacks happen to you because it could be used against your organization. Now, there's um, some specific uh, technology uh, analytics that could be used called UEBA. And basically, this is a way you could initiate attacks. Uh, here's another um, sort of uh, point here. Um, in 2017, inside a threat report, 53% of companies estimate remediation costs of $100,000 or more. 12% estimate a cost of more than $12 million. So, if you have a hack, right, you have a data breach, right, you have a privacy concern mainly. In the US, there's pretty steep penalties to pay. You have to pay for credit monitoring, you have to pay fines. There's also investigative issues and legal issues you gotta attend to, right? There's also the, the possibility of class action lawsuits. So they, this becomes very, very expensive. So let's talk about the top 10 things you gotta pay attention to. The first thing, you know, and not necessarily the least important or the most important because I, I can tell you right now, every organization, if I go to 10 organizations, every one of them are gonna do certain things better than others, right? That's, that's a fact. So some organizations are better at managing keys than others. On the other hand, some organizations are much better at managing data services than others. So don't take this as, you know, as a fact, this is just my opinion on things that I see over time. And some things hopefully you're gonna learn here that you could take back to your organizations. Okay, the first thing is, is improve your key management. That's your KMS. Generally, this is going to use certificates like X509 certs. Um, it's going to use PKA, uh, PKI that is, um, public key infrastructure. Uh, it's, let's see Q&A here, any Q&A? Quick question, let me just check here. Just wanna give you a second here. Okay, so no, no questions as of yet. Okay, so I must be uh, explaining things pretty well, hopefully. Um, so, so number 10, just some of the things I see. One of the, the main things that comes up over and over is Charlie or Susan left the company three months ago and lo and behold, 
they still have files on Amazon S3. Or they have about, I, I, I went into this transportation company, a railroad uh, organization, and basically they had in their cloud services literally about 17 accounts in three months where the, the folks have left the company. Some of those accounts literally had spun up 150 or so virtual machines. Not only is that a security risk, but that's a massive cost to the organization. Because again, if you're using VMs in that organization, the two major costs to, uh, to typically a cloud spend is going to be virtual machines and data storage and for most organizations. Could also be other services if you're more into the data sciences and analytics, but generally it's storage or virtual machines. Now, the second thing is, is you wanna work with, you know, human resources. Human resources is critical to help you easily identify who's who, right? So proactive identification. Now I know this is not anything really technical. This is more of a, this is just your, your you know, good old fashioned best practice and policy. And it's remarkable to see how many organizations still don't do it. So let's talk about the next thing, audit logging. Now, for example, you could use Stack Driver, you could use Cloud Trail in AWS, whatever you so choose. Now, audit logging has several benefits. The first is it's going to allow you to keep track of what resources are being used, who's doing what, when, where, how. You could, you could basically configure logging um, to be as unspecific or as specific as you like. For example, Google Stack Driver is extremely powerful in what you could do with it. You have the ability to be reactive, but you have the ability to be proactive, right? It's all about being proactive. So when it comes to filtering, now filtering is what? When we talk about filtering a log file, what this means is this. Let's say, for example, someone goes to a website and we get that error that we get, not available, that 404 error, right? We could filter our, basically, our cloud environment uh, and log every, for, every error and then filter for certain errors. Or let's say someone logs in from a specific IP address or domain. Let's say, for example, your company is based in the United States and you don't have any workers in Taiwan or in China or in India, right? And it's odd that someone will be logging in from that location. Now, it could be someone is on vacation there or work, perfectly fine. Again, you could, you could do as little or as much as you like with logging. Generally, I find logging is lazy. What I mean by lazy is generally organizations do the minimum, only what they're told. Um, and this could be the downfall. For example, there is a big uh, credit card hack several years ago with Heartland Processing. And, it, and, and I'm sure you must have read that use case because that was a use case and you know what could have been done to mitigate issues. And if they had proper logging and filtering and people paying attention, it would have been known that someone was inside, um, you know, for quite a while doing things. But again, a lot of this is proactive. You got to make the time. You got you to stop making excuses. Uh, it is what it is. Okay. Now create alerts, right? Very simple to create alerts. Um, compliance. Now, one of the challenges too is if you have PCI, HIPAA, socks uh, if you're in europe you may have gdpr whatever that is right you know whatever compliance requirements you may have um for example uh, you may have to um you know look at those specific requirements and also monitor compliance but also monitor non-compliant items such as performance errors so on and so on 
the next thing that comes up is um, lock down the protocols, right? You don't want to have ports open that don't need to be open. Uh, one of the big things I see is a lot of uh, folks will spin up Windows machines. Now, Windows machines, you can log in with PowerShell. You could also log in um, uh, with PShell. I think it's called PShell, actually, I mean, but that's PowerShell. Uh, but you could also use RDP, which is remote um, data protocol, right? Uh, RDP. Now, you don't want to have that protocol open if you don't need to. You could use basically a centralized uh, bastion host to log in instead as well. So try not to leave something open that doesn't need to. Allow services and not people. What I mean by that is try to minimize the accounts you have. You're going to have service accounts, right? Service accounts are going to do what? They're going to be server-to-server -server communications. And the goal of that is for, for basically point A and point B to send information or to receive information. It could be to pick up a file or drop a file. It could be just basically ingesting data as a batch file, whatever that is, right? Now, there's a best practice that is um, referenced as use the principle of least privilege. What does that mean? Well, basically, this is a best practice practice in the industry, right? Excuse me one sec. Okay. Uh, this is the best practice. Now, any for anyone that's taken basic uh, security courses, even like Security Plus, uh, CISSP, CASP, uh, whatever that security course was, you probably have ran into the principal least privilege. Now, Basically, what this means is you're going to essentially minimize permissions for users. You're going to basically group people in a lot of cases. If you have admins, place them in the admin group. If you have basically compliance uh, you know, auditors, let's say, auditors typically don't need to have right access. Okay, They don't need to have the run of the mill either. Just give the auditors only the permissions they need to pull the logs that they need to review resources that they need. When I reference like I am a lockdown, what I'm stating here is this, assign permissions in a granular manner. It goes without saying that if someone needs to, um, uh, you know, for example, think about it from this perspective. If, um, if you work at a company, you have a, a key fob, Right, this key fob grants you access to the building. Now, there may be certain rooms like the executive suite, or if you don't work in the data center, you don't have access to the data center, right? So you just wanna give that key fob access to folks that need to get into specific rooms or levels or floors, right? No different uh, in the cloud minimize the privileges. Don't let people walk around. You don't want them to, to do that. Okay, I'll go ahead. Let's see, we have about uh, 15 minutes. We're right on schedule for questions uh, and comments as well. We want to review. Now, this is an area that's missed quite a bit because um, interesting uh, story. I could go on, uh, but for time purposes, I won't get too deep into it. But um, if you're a database administrator, you probably understand the difference, for example, between like uh, instances, rows, columns, and everything, right? Now, one of the challenges is that every database has specific strengths and weaknesses. For, for example, MySQL, NoSQL, NewSQL. Some is stru you know, SQL structured, whereas the others are unstructured or semi-structured, depending on how you look at it. Generally, you want to review signatures. You want to assign proper roles as well. You don't want to, uh, you know, this I've seen more than a few times still, is you don't want to, you know, enter anything in plain text, encrypt everything, you know. Uh, if, if you need to go ahead and get encryption at rest or, you know, most of the cloud prat platforms support, uh, like Google, for example, by default, Everything is um, basically encrypted at rest. And you could also encrypt in flight as well if you so choose. 
Now we have multi-factor authentication. Now, this is very similar to you basically answering a pin code, right? But what about, you know, if I wanna validate, I'm actually Joe Holbrook, but is it actually Joe Holbrook's credit card or debit card, right? This is sort of, you know, what I'm getting at. Think about as something I have and something inside my head that I know. And that's the thing, a lot of organizations still don't use multi-factor authentication, like a pin code or perhaps a passphrase. So basically every vendor supports it. There's no reason whatsoever not to enable it. Uh, if I go into three companies, chances are one out of the three will not have enabled multi-factor authentication. If you believe that, it's pretty surprising. Encrypt your data. Now, once again, encrypt at rest or in flight. Now, Google is fully encrypted by default. Basically, it's done for you automatically. You don't have to think about it. Cloud provider best practices. Now, every cloud provider has best practices. Matter of fact, the one of the things you have to do really is go to your favorite search engine and search for AWS security white paper or go find the Google Cloud security white paper. Now, AWS, I'll be very honest, is hands down 100 times better at documentation, best practices, workflows. Um, if it's been done, it's probably been done on AWS. In other words, AWS has already gotten to it. Google Cloud, um, they're a little different. You know, they don't look at documentation the same way. They seem to think everybody should be a MBA graduate or, or a, uh, you know, a technical guru that knows code inside and out. So they, they have a different audience, to be honest. They're more focused on developers. However, they are changing the way that they're looking at things. And I think the documentation hopefully will get better over time. Azure has fairly decent documentation as well. But what you want to do is just review what the vendor has already done. That it's been done for you. Um, with AWS, I mean, it's literally a security course. I mean, if you go through all their security documentation, just on white papers and case studies, it's, it's better than taking a course for CISSP or Security Plus, to be very honest. They, they do an amazing job. Now, Google, on the other hand, they give you like six pages and expect you to go out and do about 100 Google searches. Like I said, it's different. I'm not putting anyone down. I'm just sort of saying you gotta, gotta understand, you gotta do more work with Google. It's, it's just a fact. However, I'm gonna be honest too, Google does a better job on the back end. On the front end, they need some help. But on the back end with the encryption and the key management and the fact that with Google Cloud, you have the backbone. So these service to service communications go over the, the Google backplane and, and that's amazing. But again, on the front end, you as a customer, you gotta figure out more things. So that's really the difference. So vendors generally know, know, know their platform better than, than most partners as well. Um, build security into your DevOps per practices, right? Now, what is DevOps? Uh, basically, it's development and operations working together to help bring about an agile environment. Now, there's 100 different definitions of DevOps, so don't take that literally, that's just the most simplified definition out there. Sometimes the best way to mitigate issues is to mitigate those vulnerabilities before they go to production, right? It's better to take care of it before you release it to the public, right? Once again, developers can make mistakes, code can have a bad code. Uh, there's another term that's used called rogue code. That could be an issue. But with that said, um, you know, having solid development purposes, for example, in the cloud, you could use Google Cloud, use App Engine, 
and have those uh, applications that you're running on App Engine basically go through Security Scanner. And Security Scan is gonna look for pretty much all the, the most common vulnerabilities out there automatically. Like Java code has typically a lot of vulnerabilities, any kind of HTML. It's gonna go ahead and, and search for this automatically. Also too, before you release any of the public, consider like A-B testing, right? One of the things that you don't wanna do is update your code too much. Um, I always like to tell clients and, and make a comparison here. For those um, that have been in IT a while and have had the privilege to work in um, Windows Arena back in the early 2000s uh, or late 90s, we, we know what would happen when we installed a service pack, right? What's a service pack? Could be hundreds of patches in some cases. It's sometimes it's better to not do that and actually just do one piece of code at a time or one patch at a time. With DevOps, the goal is to make little changes immediately, push it out. Make another little change, push it out, assuming that there's no issues, right? Twitter does this and has been doing that for years. They were one of the, one of the leaders in that area. Um, so again, continuous integration, continuous development. These are areas that uh, are growing. And if you're a cloud architect, cloud security manager, cloud uh, you know, administrator, whatever your title is, uh, enterprise en engineer, enterprise architect, uh, whatever your title is, you need to know about development. It, it's, it's one of those areas that's becoming more and more required. Lastly, the last item I want to cover is um, securing your APIs. APIs and endpoints. So I had referenced that uh, APIs are what? Application programming interfaces. Now, now with uh, APIs, these are basically what I like to call on ramps to the cloud. Basically, you're going up under the highway to the cloud. The APIs are going to help ensure that your client app is essentially communicating with the cloud service in a manner that is configured appropriately. It's, it's an OMRAP. There's a lot more to it than that, but they also provide sort of what I would call consolidated services that enable the developers to put the cloud uh, applications, the services together much quicker and, and more efficiently. Part of the APIs could be, you know, having a config review. Uh, it's also a common practice to use solutions such as Mastery for like an API gateway. Also too, Google has like cloud endpoints, AWS has solutions and, and Azure as well. You also wanna have lifecycle management. Uh, it's very common to deploy APIs and leave them there. APIs are basically remote procedure calls. You're basically given the keys to the kingdom if you're not careful. So if you don't need to have that old version of the API, just, just remove it. No need to be there. Your developers should be uh, paying attention and not asleep at the wheel. However, like I had stated before, um, before uh, when I spoke about DevOps, just one quick note is um, to also realize that developers and operations folks have traditionally not communicated well together. The goal of DevOps is to facilitate this, uh, you know, a little bit more efficiently, right? Endpoints are critical. Now, endpoints act as like a proxy as well. Um, basically, like I said, it's like an on-ramp. It allows you to access the uh, cloud portal, allows you to access the cloud services. But remember, an API is going to be a remote procedure call, basically, and it's going to be limited in what you do. You're going to be able to list. You're going to be able to get, right? That's you know, only a limited am amount of uh, capacity there. Now, uh, one quick note uh, before we get ready to wrap up here. One of the things that, you know, again, uh, is to consider a training plan for your organization. Um, remember that 95% of the cloud security issues I had mentioned earlier are typically, uh, a, you know, a result of the customer the environment, the culture, 
just not paying attention and, and being proactive. And a lot of this can be remedied by just awareness training, right? Mitigate the issues that you can understand, right? Uh, if you have proper training, right, people will, um, most, uh, most good people that want to provide value to your company as an employee will pay attention and will think and will act and will be proactive. There's always going to be a few that, you know, are there for other reasons and not really to provide value. That's up to you to mitigate and alleviate through management. But just realize that uh, having employees that actually pay attention can identify risk and mitigate that risk is really a big deal. Now, there's some other terms I didn't cover in this course, um, such as zero trust. Zero trust is another area that I'm seeing grow, um, at least in awareness. Now, just a brief note on what it is before we close out and go to Q&A, is um, a zero trust is basically a framework where you look at things differently. This is where you as an organization say, you know, even though Frank is an employee in the company, we're still not gonna trust him. We gotta have him prove who he is before he can access the cloud resources. So just because he's sitting inside, you know, your company building doesn't mean you should trust him, right? Because generally what happens is most organizations trust what's coming, you know, trust the traffic inside the organization, right? However, it's pretty common for organizations not to trust traffic coming into the organization. So what's inside, you know, is good, but typically what comes from outside is, you know, not as good, right? That's how it's typically looked at. Now, technically that sort of makes sense in some cases, however, if you have 95% of your issues historically of your data breaches occur because of you know, rogue actors inside like contractors, there's a lot of good use cases, there's a lot of good examples of how not to handle security. Um, there is a, uh, a boot company that made boots and sold them um, across the country and the world. Well, they had an administrator who was a cloud administrator who apparently did not get a good performance review. So he decided that he would basically insert some rogue code, basically a Trojan, um, as you may have heard, uh, basically to kick off at a certain time and shut down their Outlook services and their data storage services that they were using. Well, unfortunately, the administrator didn't think that when you get in the way of interstate commerce, that is a federal offense. So he's enjoying some time in federal prison. So what had happened is he left the company, but the, the human resources and the IT manager uh, did not disable his accounts, and so they left it open. And there's a lots of cases of this happening. Uh, but you could also have issues where, you know, again, contractors could be a concern, uh, vendors, so on and so on. So with that said, um, please do view the, um, um, the WebAge website for upcoming classes. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd love to be able to answer a few. Uh, that's about all that I had. Um, and I'll hang out for some questions. Thank you. Okay, anyone, any other questions? Let me check Q&A. And, and actually, I'm gonna open up the audio for those folks that are interested. Uh, feel free to um, speak up. Okay, if you have any questions, uh, feel free. Okay, well, I wanted to thank everyone for joining. Um, if there's no other questions, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording and uh, you will of course have a copy of the presentation sent to you as well as the recording 
please do reach out to WebAge or feel free to uh, reach out to myself as well if you have any questions. Thank you so much and have a great week ahead.